Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. In a couple of weeks from now, the Ukraine war will complete one year. President Zelensky is touring Europe asking for more weapons. But Europeans are dealing with a bombshell, yet another revelation that the White House was quick to deny and the Western press doesn't really want to talk about. Did America bomb the Nord Stream pipelines? Russia wants a probe, but who is listening? We bring you the details of the investigation that could change the course of this war. Meanwhile, Turkey is picking up the pieces, 15,000 dead and counting. President Erdogan is on the back foot, he has publicly snubbed Pakistan. The Pakistani Prime Minister wanted to visit. Turkey said, don't come. But why did he want to go at a time like this? We'll tell you about it. Also, why Disney is firing 7,000 people. Is it the end of the streaming boom? It's an action-packed Thursday. The headlines first. Trade, chips, balloons, America and China are fighting over everything, it seems. US President Biden said Chinese leader Xi Jinping faces, quote-unquote, enormous problems. China calls the remarks, and I'm quoting, extremely irresponsible and counter to basic diplomatic etiquette. North Korea's Kim Jong-un shows off his daughter and his nukes. The largest number of nuclear missiles were displayed at a military parade, including more than 10 Wasong-17 intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of striking the US mainland. Russia's private army, the Wagner Mercenary Group, says it has ended its recruitment drive at Russian prisons. Reports say the prisoners were promised amnesty on their return to Russia if they survived the war in Ukraine. Pakistan says it will have a bailout deal today, a deal worth $7 billion. Finance Minister Ishakdar says matters between the government and the International Monetary Fund will be settled by today. And one more chatbot is entering the fray. Chinese tech giant Alibaba says it's developing its own artificial intelligence tool, joining the race with another Chinese giant Baidu and Google's Bard. Yesterday it was the United Kingdom, today it was Brussels. Europe is rolling out the red carpet for Zelensky, even if they won't give him or his country an EU membership anytime soon. And now the tour has been overshadowed by a major expose. The United States bombed the Nord Stream pipelines. That's the claim made by Seymour Hirsch, a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist, the same one who exposed the My Lai massacre in the Vietnam War. And now he says America bombed Russia's pipeline to Europe. This could change everything. Zelensky is running out of time. Ukraine says a major Russian offensive is imminent in this month and it wants all the help it can get. But Europe is dragging its heels. Tonight, we've put together the most comprehensive report for you. We'll start with the Nord Stream revelations. Do you remember these pictures? This is the Nord Stream pipeline. It was leaking last year. The Nord Stream is the lifeline of Europe. In fact, these are two pipelines, the Nord Stream 1 and 2. They were bombed last year. In September 2022, a series of powerful explosions were reported. Both pipelines took the hit. Initially, fingers were pointed at Russia, but there was no credible evidence. Now, a new report has emerged. It says the pipelines were bombed by the U.S., this is a 5,000-word report. We've managed to put together a summary. And here are the five big takeaways. Number one, the bombing was a covert operation. It was carried out by the CIA. This is according to the report. Takeaway number two, the U.S. used deep-sea divers for this mission. They mobilized during a NATO military exercise. That drill, that NATO drill, was used as a cover. Takeaway number three, mines were planted along the pipelines. They were detonated remotely. Takeaway number four, the CIA worked with Norway to bomb these pipelines. And takeaway number five, the orders came from the very top. U.S. President Joe Biden ordered this operation. And that, perhaps, is the biggest takeaway from this report. Did Biden sabotage Europe's gas lifeline? All of this is based on an investigation by journalist Seymour Hirsch. He's broken some big stories in the past like the mass murder of 500 civilians by American soldiers in Vietnam. This was in 1968. 
Harsh has exposed governments and presidents in the past too. But some of his work has also been criticized for lack of evidence. What about this latest report? Does he have evidence this time? Washington says he doesn't. The U.S. government has rejected the report. They're calling the claims preposterous. The U.S. State Department issued a statement. I have a copy with me. And this is what it says. I'm quoting, The idea that the United States was in any way involved in the apparent sabotage of these pipelines is preposterous. It is nothing more than a function of Russian disinformation and should be treated as such. Of course, Russia doesn't agree. It wants an international probe into the Nord Stream blasts. The Russian foreign minister says he's putting together a report himself. We are also preparing a kind of report into what has happened over the past year and what we managed to uncover. It is not just on U.S. military biological programs that they're trying to make out they don't have anything to do with, lying as they always do. And it is not just about the U.S. being directly involved in the explosions on the Nord Stream pipelines. Mrs. Newland has already pleaded guilty to it. So there are many things we can remember to show the methods that the United States uses to achieve dominance. These claims will cast a shadow on Zelensky's Europe trip. He began the visit yesterday. The first stop was the United Kingdom. Zelensky got the full royal treatment there. He met with King Charles. And then he sat down with the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. His final stop was Westminster Hall. Quite a grand setting there. Zelensky used this opportunity to do what he does best, make more demands. He relaunched his campaign for Western fighter jets. In fact, the former actor pulled a bit of a stunt here. He brought a fighter pilot's helmet with him. What for? to present it to the Speaker of the House of Commons. The House of Commons, of course, is the lower house of the British Parliament. Full marks for the showmanship. It was followed by an appeal. We have freedom. Give us wings to protect it. I trust this symbol will help us for our next coalition, coalition of the planes. And I appeal to you and the world with simple and yet most important words combat aircrafts for Ukraine, wings for freedom. Wings of freedom. That was Zelensky's appeal. Did it work, though? To some extent, it did. The UK has begun looking into sending combat aircraft to Ukraine. They're looking at the possibility. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says nothing is off the table, but his friends in Europe may not share his enthusiasm. Zelensky's next stop was Paris. He met with President Macron of France and Chancellor Scholz of Germany, both in Paris. These two leaders, Macron and Scholz, hold the key to unlocking the fighter jets. So Zelensky repeated his demand. Well, they offered support, but not the jets. No commitment on giving Ukraine fighter jets. Ukraine can count on France, its European partners and its allies to win the war. Russia cannot and must not win. We have also provided Ukraine with massive financial, humanitarian and weapon support, heavy artillery, air defences and most recently the delivery of battle tanks. And we will continue to do so for as long as necessary. A few hours before making that statement, Scholz was in, in the Bundestag, the lower house of the German parliament. Here he launched a scathing attack. The target was Germany's Western allies, more specifically the United States. Listen to what he said there, and I'm quoting, we preserve and strengthen this cohesion by first preparing decisions confidentially and only then communicating them, the decisions. What harms our unity is a public competition to outdo each other along the lines of battle tanks, submarines, aircraft. Who is asking for more? This is the German Chancellor. Report say Scholz was referring to his cooperation with US President Joe Biden. This was about the decision to supply tanks to Ukraine. Why is the German leader upset? Is he unhappy with America's approach? Well, he didn't say that. Guess he didn't have to. But coming back to the Nord Stream pipelines, why are they such a big deal? Why are they called Europe's lifeline? And how did they give Russia so much leverage over Europe? It's a story of geopolitics, economics, and shifting alliances. The Nord Stream pipelines were not the only means for Russia to send gas to Europe but they were extremely lucrative and offered Moscow political leverage.
Our next report tells you why the inside story of these two pipelines could change the course of this war. There are two Nord Stream pipelines, the Nord Stream 1 and 2. Both pipelines supply natural gas from Russia to Germany. Russia has the world's largest deposits of natural gas. It is used throughout the country and Russia has more than enough to export. The Nord Stream pipelines originate at two different points in Western Russia. They go beneath the Baltic Sea, then surface in northeastern Germany. Both pipelines stretch for about 1,200 kilometers. In Russia, they're connected to the country's own natural gas pipelines. They reach Germany from where other pipelines carry natural gas all over Europe. The Nord Stream 1 is operated by the company Nord Stream AG. The company was founded in 2005 and is headquartered in Switzerland. It's a joint venture between Russian state gas giant Gazprom and German, French and Dutch energy companies. Gazprom owns 51% of Nord Stream AG, making it the largest shareholder. This is significant because Gazprom is a Russian state-owned company, so the profits from the Nord Stream pipelines directly end up in Moscow's coffers, which means even if they did not want to, Europe was funding Russia's war in Ukraine by just using natural gas. And though they supported Ukraine, European nations could not just stop using Russian gas overnight. This is because Europe had been dependent on cheap Russian gas for years. Work on the Nord Stream 1 pipeline project began in 1997. After the initial studies and finalizing the schedule, construction began in December 2005. The first part of the Nord Stream 1 pipeline was completed and officially inaugurated in 2011. The ceremony was held in Germany, and the leaders of Russia, Germany, France, and the Netherlands all took part. This heralded the era of cheap Russian gas in Western Europe. Germany in particular became increasingly reliant on it. Before the war in Ukraine, Germany depended on Russia for 55% of its gas. About 35% of all Russian gas to EU members came via this pipeline. The nominal capacity of the Nord Stream 1 was 55 billion cubic meters per annum. In 2021, the pipeline transported more than 59 billion cubic meters of natural gas. Nord Stream 2 would have expanded Russia's capacity to 110 billion cubic meters. This would have made the EU even more dependent. And those dependencies could have been weaponized. Before the September explosions shut down both the pipelines, Russia was already manipulating the flow of gas. In June, it restricted supplies by about 75%. In July, Russia shut down the pipeline for maintenance and cut supplies further when it reopened. Russia shut down the pipeline entirely in late August. It blamed Western sanctions for the shutdowns and restrictions. It said sanctions made maintenance difficult. And every time Russia squeezed the gas pipelines, prices rose around the world. Russia could hurt the West just by tweaking the Nord Stream output. It could hold Europe to ransom due to the dependency on cheap gas. Until September, that is. Blasts in the Baltic Sea damaged both Nord Stream pipelines. Though they'd already been shut by then, natural gas contained in them was released into the atmosphere. It is unknown if the pipelines will ever work again. The blasts had another effect. They forced Europe to wean away from cheap Russian gas. Is it good? 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 Is it good?
Let's shift our attention to Turkey. Two days after the devastating earthquakes, their president was on the front line. Recep Tayyip Erdogan made an honest confession. Certainly there have been shortfalls as the conditions have been clear. It's impossible to be prepared to face a disaster like this. Turkey was unprepared. It's evident. The crisis is spiraling. The death toll has crossed the 15,000 mark. Thousands of buildings have collapsed. Yesterday, their stock markets witnessed a bloodbath. $35 billion worth of wealth was erased. $35 billion in a day. Trading has been suspended for five days. President Erdogan faces a crisis of a lifetime. But guess, what is he thinking about? Elections. They're due in three months. The Turkish president still wants to go ahead with the polls. Reports say Erdogan wants voting to happen on the 14th of May. This is as per the original plan. Ten provinces in the country are affected by the quake. They are under a state of emergency, and now the president wants to lift this emergency sooner than planned. He is making promises to voters. Of course, there were some problems on the first day, but after that, the situation was brought under control on the second day and today. We are carrying on managing with rubble. God willing, we will start to remove rubble. God willing, our aim is to rebuild houses in one year, as we already did previously in areas hit by earthquakes, both Kahraman Maras and other provinces. Our people must not worry. We won't allow any of our citizens to be left in the streets. A vow to rebuild entire cities in one year. That sounded a lot like a campaign speech. There was a good chance it was. Erdogan toured some of the quake hit regions yesterday. These are strongholds of the AK party. This is Erdogan's party, the Justice and Development Party, AKP. People in these regions tend to vote for the AKP. Now they've been hit by the deadliest earthquake in a generation. Rescue efforts are still on, but they leave a lot to be desired. Many people still remain trapped, and the president seems more worried about retaining his votes. Public anger is mounting. Victims say they're not getting the kind of help they need. They still don't have the right rescue equipment, the expertise and the support to pull people out of the rubble. Rescue workers are using bare hands to dig through the concrete. The survivors are frustrated. They're appealing for help. There is a bit of chaos, as you see. We are suffering. Please, whoever hears us, help us. We are here. Everything has collapsed. There are cracks everywhere. Our homes have collapsed. We are living here in despair. Here is our home and here is our situation. I don't remember how I got out of rubbles and how I rescued my kids. We ask for help from our government, from our state and from the world. And we don't want anything else. Is Erdogan listening to these voices? Where is all the relief material going? What happened to the relief funds collected from the Turkish people? I'm talking about the famous earthquake tax. It is officially called the Special Communications Tax. This was introduced in 1999. It was right after a deadly earthquake hit the city of Izmit. More than 17,000 people died then, 1999. The government introduced what is called an earthquake tax to gather funds to deal with such calamities. And this tax is still in place all these years later. It is charged on the use of internet and mobile phone services. What is the purpose of the tax again? Disaster prevention and development of Turkey's emergency services. How much money does this fund have? Around 88 billion lira, according to some estimates, which, which is about 4.6 billion US dollars. This is above and beyond the foreign aid that Turkey is getting. So again, where did all the money go? No answers yet. Only speculation and theories doing the rounds. One report says the tax proceeds were used to fund infrastructure projects. Another report claims the money was used to repay loans to the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Now, we have not been able to verify any of this, and the government has issued no statement. An opposition lawmaker has questioned Erdogan. He said, and I'm quoting, You've been collecting earthquake tax to protect people for years. 
10 provinces are dying, you are still waiting for financial aid. Criticism of Erdogan is spreading on social media. Guess what he did? Shut down Twitter. That happened yesterday. Twitter went offline in Turkey. Critics seem to be facing a crackdown. The Turkish police force detained 18 people and arrested five. On what grounds? Police say they shared, quote-unquote, provocative posts on social media. The Erdogan government does not tolerate dissent. The state of emergency helps. It may or may not help the victims, but it gives the government an excuse to go after critics. The government of Turkey has a lot on its plate, and that's an understatement. The last thing they want is to attend to guests. But who wants to pay a visit to Turkey at this time? The Prime Minister of Pakistan, he wanted to go to Ankara. The Turks have told him, no thank you, don't come now. Not sure what the Pakistanis were expecting, but they've got just what they deserved. This country sure has a knack for global humiliation. Pakistan had a big plan laid out, a full delegation led by the Prime Minister himself. Shehbaz Sharif was, on, was supposed to leave on Wednesday. With him, Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari and a bunch of senior officials. What were they going for? To show solidarity with Turkey, because that's what Turkey needs the most, the solidarity of Pakistan. Brought to it by a heavy delegation of the Pakistani government. Rescue and relief operations? Well, they can wait. Pakistan thought Turkey would lay out the red carpet for its visiting delegation. The opposite happened. Pakistan was told to cancel the visit. Any guesses why? Because Turkey neither has the time nor the resources to entertain a Pakistani delegation at this point. Again, why were these leaders going in the first place? They said they wanted to personally express condolences, to stand in solidarity with Turkey. It makes no sense whatsoever. What Erdogan's country needs right now is help aid and resources, not a contingent of foreign dignitaries to entertain while its people remain stuck in the rubble. No wonder they asked the Pakistani Prime Minister to cancel his visit. They said they're quote-unquote busy in the earthquake rescue and relief operations. Now that's quite a snub and a public snub at that from a country that has always sided with Pakistan. How is Pakistan taking it? They've seen enough snubs to get used to them. They're trying to save face. Express News cited sources in the Pakistani Foreign Ministry. And things get a bit funny here. Pakistan says Shehbaz Sharif's visit got cancelled due to, wait for it, bad weather. Pakistan says its Prime Minister would not be able to visit the affected areas. Why? Because his helicopter would not be able to fly during bad weather. Fair enough. What about the storm at home? Pakistan is collapsing without an earthquake. It is facing the worst economic crisis in its history, the worst since Pakistan was formed. A new report sheds light on their colossal mismanagement. This country has taken more than 20 loans from the International Monetary Fund. That's the highest number in the world. And guess what? None of the loans have been completed, according to this report, meaning the IMF never disbursed the full amount to Pakistan. Why? Because Pakistan has the distinguished track record of not fulfilling the IMF's conditions. They violate the terms each and every time, and the money stops. Then they ask for another loan. This country will sink if it doesn't get bailed out. So it keeps taking loans not just from international agencies, but also from countries like China, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, perhaps even Turkey. Pakistan is desperate. Inflation stood at a 48-year high last year, more than 27%. The currency is depreciating. Forex reserves are dwindling. Power blackouts seem endless. So what if Turkey is struggling to cope with the impact of an earthquake? The Pakistani begging bowl waits for none. It sees no place in time. It's always there, waiting to be filled. And for Pakistan, the Turkish snub is very embarrassing because this is one of the last countries that still takes Pakistan seriously, or it did until a few days back. But you see, brotherly ties have their limits too. Guess the same can be said for another set of countries, India and Bangladesh, a very special relationship. Bangladesh is a country crucial to India's interests a country that India helped liberate by fighting a war with Pakistan, a country that is an important partner of India. It's a country that was actually part of the undivided Bharat before the British broke it up. So there, was, there were a lot of Hindus in Bangladesh. There still are. But the picture has changed considerably. 
In 1901, Hindus made up 33% of the population of what is now Bangladesh, 33%. Do you know what the number is today? 7.9%. Hindus constitute less than 8% of the population of today's Bangladesh. Where did the rest of them go? About 3 million Bengali Hindus fled to India during partition. But even after that, Hindus made up a significant chunk of Bangladesh's population. In 1951, they made up about 22% of the country's population. Back then, Bangladesh was called East Pakistan. And living under Pakistani rule was a nightmare for Bengali Hindus. Today's Bangladesh calls itself a secular country, but living in it is not exactly a walk in the park for Hindus. Bangladeshi Hindus are under constant threat. Their way of life their temples, their scriptures, even their idols. Everything has come under attack. On Sunday, 14 Hindu temples were vandalized in northeastern Bangladesh. The police say the attacks were orchestrated. At least 27 idols have been desecrated. These are idols which Hindus worship. Who orchestrated these attacks? Islamists. These are radicals suspected to be members of the Bangladesh Jamaate Islami. What's the Jamaat-e Islami? For starters, it's a group that traces its roots back to the Jamaat-e Islami Pakistan. This outfit strongly opposed Bangladesh's independence from Pakistan, and now they're targeting Bangladeshi Hindus and other minorities. Some politicians are playing along. Take the case of Tariq Rahman. I'll tell you who he is, but first let me tell you what he said. Scriptures of the Hindu religion do not offer any moral teaching. All the religious scriptures are pawn scripts. This is a political leader speaking. Tariq Rahman is an opposition leader in Bangladesh, a top aide of Nurul Haq Noor, the man leading the charge against the Sheikh Hasina government. Do you know who supports them? The Jamaat-e Islami, the same organization whose members have been going on a rampage against Hindus in Bangladesh. Can you connect the dots yet? Radical Islamists are running a campaign against the Sheikh Hasina government and caught in the crossfire are the Hindus of Bangladesh. By the way, this is not a new phenomenon. It's been going on for years, well, decades technically. Let me tell you about the recent cases though. In 2021, Durga Puja festivities turned bloody across Bangladesh. Houses belonging to Hindus were attacked. Seven people were killed. The atmosphere was so tense, they had to call off the Bijoya Dashami procession. Last month, a Hindu man's sweet shop was attacked by radicals. This happened in the Barisal area of Bangladesh. But this was hardly the most shocking part of the incident. The real danger to Hindus came after the attack on the sweet shop. Islamists threatened to make the area Hindu-free by killing all of them. One would expect the Bangladesh government to come down hard against all such elements, but that's not how it works. So far, the government has only reacted when an incident creates a social media storm. Hindus say the perpetrators are going unpunished. Criminal cases from the Durga Puja violence of 2021 are still pending. I have some data with me. Look at what this says. This is from just last year. 154 people belonging to religious minorities were killed in Bangladesh last year. 62 people from minority communities went missing. 39 women were raped. There were attempts on the life of more than 400 people from minority communities. They were left injured, but some, somehow some of them survived. Another 849 people were threatened. And these are just the registered or reported cases. Hindus are Bangladesh's second largest religious group. Yet they're living in fear. Fear that their houses will be torched, that they will be attacked, that their temples will be destroyed, and their gods defiled. Nobody should have to live, live like this, in constant fear. What's the Indian government doing about the violence against Hindus in Bangladesh? Well, not very much at the moment, at least not that we know of. New Delhi should push Dhaka to act. If India can liberate Bangladesh from Pakistan, it can surely do more to protect Indic minorities in Bangladesh. Meanwhile, Iran is flexing its military muscle. This week, it unveiled an air force base, an underground air force base codenamed Eagle 44. Iran says this base can store and operate fighter jets and drones. Then Iran celebrated its air force day. The star attraction was a missile, a missile with the words death to Israel written in Hebrew. Iran is clearly upping the ante as tensions continue to rise in West Asia. Here's a report. 
موشک سلاح ایرانی جنگنده سخو بیسوش On Wednesday, Iran celebrated its annual Air Force Day تمرین در جز از برد این موشک راه بردی را Its Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei attended a meeting with Air Force members in the capital Tehran. About 200 kilometers south of Tehran lies the city of Isfahan. There, the Islamic Revolution Guard Corps held a public military exhibition. They showcased Iran's military achievements. People walked around looking at displays featuring drones, rocket launchers and missiles. One of the missiles had Hebrew words written on it. It said, Death to Israel. Both the message and the venue of the exhibition are significant. Before we get to the details, let's look at the recent timeline of events. Tensions have been rising since Israel re-elected Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He was sworn in as the head of Israel's most right-wing government. During his campaign, Netanyahu vowed to be tough on Iran. Last month, the US and Israel held the largest ever joint exercise in Israel and the Eastern Mediterranean. About 6,400 U.S. troops, 1,500 Israeli soldiers, and over 140 aircraft were involved. These drills were seen as a message to Iran. The day after the drills ended, Iran was attacked by drones. Explosions and fires were reported in multiple locations in the country. Iran had said the drone attacks did not cause significant damage, but it has held Israel responsible. It's after the attacks that Iran revealed a new Air Force base and showcased its on-the-nose missile message. The choice of Isfahan for the exhibition was significant. It was the city that was attacked. Drones targeted a defense manufacturing facility. While the attack was attributed to Israel, Israel's policy is not to comment on any such allegations. Iran's missile display comes a day after Iran announced its first underground air force base. The Eagle 44 base is built on one of Iran's mountains. The exact location hasn't been made public. Iran's state news agencies showed tunnels housing fighter jets. These include US-built F-4E Phantom II fighters, jets Iran had acquired before the 1979 Islamic Revolution, and Soviet-era Sukhoi Su-24 fencer bombers. These jets were outfitted with Iran's latest long-range cruise missiles. Iran's Armed Forces Chief of Staff, Major General Mohammad Bagheri, gave a warning. He said, any attack on Iran from our enemies, including Israel, will see a response from our many Air Force bases, including Eagle 44. Iran's aircraft squadrons may be aging, but they are secure. The location would mean they can survive bunker buster attacks. They should be safe from drone sabotage missions as well. During a war, Iran can wait out initial assaults in its mountain base and then launch counter attacks across the region. But why would Iran reveal this Air Force base? Isn't it better to keep it a secret? Well, knowledge of the base's existence acts as a deterrent. It's something else for Israel and the U.S. to think about if they're considering an all-out war. We've been telling you about the Chinese spy balloon, a seemingly innocuous balloon that was hovering over American skies. Washington says Beijing used it to collect sensitive data. The spy balloon was, was then shot down, but the saga exposed China's extensive surveillance program. Turns out there's more. How? through CCTV cameras. You may call it another weapon in Beijing's surveillance inventory. And Australia has now vowed to act. It is removing Chinese-made CCTV cameras from key locations. Canberra says these cameras are a security threat. How many devices are we talking about? More than 900. More than 900 cameras, intercoms, video recorders, and electronic entry systems, all made by Chinese companies. These are said to have been installed in more than 200 Australian government buildings. An audit I launched six months ago has today finally revealed almost 1,000 devices provided by Chinese government-linked entities, High Vision and Dewa. Uh, they're all throughout the Commonwealth, including our Department of Defence, our Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, our Department of Home Affairs, our Attorney General's Department. And I'm calling on the Albanese government today to outline a plan to get rid of them and get rid of them all. The Albanese government took notice of this. It says that while the matter is serious, there is no need to overreact. Listen to this. 
it's important that this has been brought to our attention. Um, we're doing an assessment within Defence as to where those cameras exist and um, when we've gone through that process we'll obviously remove those questions. I don't think we should overreact to this but uh, it's important that it's been brought to our attention. It's prudent that we do the assessment and we're going to act on it. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese maintained that these wouldn't affect ties with China. Australia's diplomatic ties with Beijing is a story for another day. Tonight, we want to focus on these Chinese equipments. For starters, which are these Chinese companies? Mainly two, Hikvision and Dawa. And these two companies have manufactured devices not just for Australia, but for the rest of the world too, including India. Why are they problematic? And what's the matter with their surveillance devices? It's their ownership. Both companies are partly owned by the Chinese Communist Party. Connect the dots. Effectively, the CCP has direct access to loads of data, data and recordings from CCTVs, intercoms and other devices. From government buildings to the streets, the CCP may well be watching. And Australia is not the first to wake up to this threat. The United States and the United Kingdom did the same last year. They said they did not trust Chinese companies, so they removed the cameras. And none of this is an exaggerated response. China's growing surveillance technology is a well-documented fact. Researchers have found plenty and more evidence to show China's aggressive push in this space. Experts say these companies are at the mercy of the CCP. Some even say that Beijing is investing money to build such technology. And they're practicing it at home. Look at the findings of this study. Eight out of the world's ten most surveilled cities are in China. Chongqing tops the list. This city is covered with 2.58 million cameras. How many people live there? 15 million. So effectively, they have one camera for every six residents. And these are well-equipped machines. High-resolution cameras that can reportedly scan faces in real time. Not surprising why China is called the surveillance state. It's bad enough that they do this at home. And now they want to keep an eye on the rest of the world too. This has security implications. How big is the Chinese network of cameras? Well, we have some estimates. China has exported its surveillance technology to at least 54 countries. Many of them have inked deals with Chinese companies to enhance their internal security. Chinese companies say they're not influenced by the government. But that argument has few takers. So where does all of this leave India? I ask because India imports most of its CCTVs from China. We use the same equipments in our homes, buildings, even streets. Also from the same companies that the Australians are wary about, Hick Vision. It leads the CCTV market in India. It is said to have more than 35% of the market share. Let me rephrase that. A Chinese company partly owned by the Communist Party owns 35% of the CCTV market share in India. So is our data safe? Are we being watched too? And is the government investigating how damaging all of this can be? We don't have the answers yet. But China's notorious record does not give us much reason to be optimistic. Let's talk about the Arab world now. The Arabs aren't just the oil behemoths of the world anymore. They're diversifying and diversifying fast. From holding FIFA World Cups to owning football clubs, Arab nations are doing it all. Arabs own at least five major football clubs now. But why the sudden push in the realm of sports, particularly in football? Our next report tells you. Football is a game that excites the nerves. It's one that can change in the last 30 seconds of a match. It's a sport that has fans across the world. Ordinary viewers like us watch the game to enjoy it. But not all viewers think that way. When an Arab sheikh watches a football match, he probably wants to buy one of the teams playing. This might sound outlandish, but believe me, it's not. Arabs are buying football clubs like we shop for groceries. Qatar hosted the FIFA World Cup last year. It became the first country to do so. And that tells you something. It symbolizes the growing shift of football to West Asia, to the Arab world. Qatar has become the centerpiece of the Arab world's football puzzle. It already owns Paris Saint-Germain, but Qatar wants more. It plans to buy more clubs. It owns football clubs through QSI. QSI stands for Qatar Sports Investment. That's right, Qatar has a shareholding organization dedicated solely to sports. 
The QSI is in turn controlled by the Qatar Investment Authority, and the Qatar Investment Authority is the Arab nation's sovereign wealth fund. Qatar is in talks with many clubs. The goal is to buy them. We are talking about clubs like Manchester United, Liverpool FC, and Tottenham Hotspur. Big names in the football world, Qatar is looking to buy at least one of them, and Manchester United is its preferred choice. Reports say Qatari investors will quote unquote imminently bid for Manchester United, and the push is coming from the top. This man is the Emir of Qatar, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, and he is willing to spend $4.5 billion to buy Manchester United. The Saudis too are in the thick of football. Saudi Arabia owns Newcastle United. Before the Saudi takeover, the club was one of the worst performing teams in the English Premier League. But then the tables turned. Newcastle went on to become the richest football club in the world, and it's not alone. The Saudis also own Sheffield United. Saudi Arabia's Abdullah bin Mossad Al Saud is the man who controls the club. There are reports that Nigerian billionaire Dozi Mobusi is looking to buy the club. But as of now, there remain reports. Manchester City is a major football club. It is owned by the United Arab Emirates' Sheikh Mansour. Then there's the Aston Villa Football Club, owned by Egypt's Nasser Sawiris. What are the Arabs doing controlling so many football clubs? Let's break this down for you. First, the Arabs have a lot of money. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot. It's no biggie for them to buy football clubs. And the benefits are many. Consider it an investment, an investment which puts their country on the world map. Oil won't always be the sensation it is right now. The world is moving in that direction. What happens when oil isn't the driver of global energy markets? The scenes won't be pretty for the Arab world. So Arab kingdoms are preparing for a post-oil world. The European football scene is a gold mine for those having the capital to invest in it. The value of the 32 most prominent European soccer clubs increased by 9% in 2019. What about revenues? They increased by 65% in just eight years. The economic benefits are many, but there's a social angle as well. Controlling football clubs makes you part of an elite clique, and it helps the image of the country that you represent. Arab kingdoms have a lot of money, but many of them suffer from an image crisis. So they're making a major football push, trying to sports wash their country's image. What sports washing? It's when countries use sports as a tool to improve their reputation. When Saudi Arabia took over Newcastle, thousands of the club's fans celebrated by waving the Saudi flag and donning Saudi attire. The takeover of football clubs is also a way for wealthy Arabs to park their money. But this is part of a larger strategic, economic, and social plan. One that doesn't have oil at its center. Mass layoffs are sweeping big corporations. We've talked about this before. Some company or the other is making headlines every week. Meta, Microsoft, Alphabet. These are just some of the examples. But big tech is not the only target. The U.S. media is facing massive job cuts too. Not to mention, it's happening amid economic gloom. And this period of media industry turmoil has claimed its latest victim. Disney, the world's largest entertainment company, Disney has made a serious announcement. Disney will cut 7,000 jobs from its global workforce. That's about 3% of its total staff. Raising the question, is this the end of the streaming boom? Why is Disney letting go of 7,000 people? The company's CEO Bob Iger spoke about this. I do not make this decision lightly, he said. Well, we hope that is the case because this is surely a big decision, the biggest one yet since he returned as CEO in November last year. Positive changes have been seen after he retook the reins. Disney's revenue in the last quarter rose by eight percent. Profits exceeded Wall Street expectations. The company's streaming division saw an improvement. Losses were down by four hundred million dollars. Then why the job cuts? Because Iger plans to attain sustained growth. Disney wants to streamline operations. It is cutting costs, five and a half billion dollars, to be precise. That is the plan, and this explains the depressing announcement of layoffs. Disney is also scaling down its content operations. That will be another three billion dollars in cost savings. 
What are content operations? For Disney, this means movies and television shows. They've been losing subscribers. In the last quarter, Disney lost about 2.4 million subscribers worldwide. And India contributed in a big way. The low-priced Disney Plus version in India saw a decline. But this story is not unique to Disney. Streaming services are struggling everywhere, it seems. Again, raising the question, has the streaming revolution peaked? Here is a clue. The pandemic and the lockdowns fueled an entertainment boom. People had more time. They wanted a distraction. So streaming services made big money. They saw record-breaking growth. Netflix added a record 37 million subscribers in 2020. Newcomer Disney Plus hit 100 million in 16 months. Do you know how long Netflix took to reach 100 million? A decade. Disney Plus did it in 16 months. But now the pandemic has ended and the streaming market is facing the perfect storm. Slower growth, more competition and an audience returning to office. Binge watching has become a weekend affair again for most people. I'm sure you know what binge watching is. Watching content for a long time, binging on it. Usually an entire TV show in a single sitting. Sounds bizarre, but a lot of us were happily doing it, locked down in our homes. That was then. How much time do we make for TV now? If you dislike returning to your office desk, remember your streaming service dislikes it too. And that's just one reason for declining viewership. The other is money, stretched household budgets. Providers understand that not all customers are financially equal. India is a classic example of this. Its market potential is huge. But customers are not able or not willing to pay much for these services. It makes the price competition fierce. Maybe the new golden age of TV is proving to be too much of a good thing. With streaming fatigue and lack of time, viewers have grown increasingly selective, not only for what they pay for, but also for what they manage. So for those of you watching this show, we say, well done. You're being wise with your time. And now it's time to wrap up with Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. When was the last time you went for a run? Well, here's some inspiration for you to go running tomorrow. A German athlete ran about 60 kilometers a day for three months, 6-0. He ran through deserts, beaches, rainforests and snowy mountains covering over 5,000 kilometers. Goes on to show what a human body is capable of achieving. Valentine's Day is around the corner and guess who is getting ready to make a killing? The flower growers of Colombia, they export their blooms to more than 100 countries. In Turkey, meanwhile, Strawberry the cat was rescued from under the rubble. She was found shivering but is now said to be in good hands. And finally, you must have heard of pet-friendly cafes. In Costa Rica, there's a human-friendly cafe. It caters to four-legged customers and humans are free to tag along. We're leaving you with these images. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Çilek merhaba. Tamam titriyor ya. Aha, böyle bu Ha, ha, ha.